So I'm Jeff Bunning, and I am a PhD candidate at the Research School of Earth Sciences at ANU. Um, so most of the time, what I like to study um, are the chondrites, and they're these really primitive meteorites, and they're the building blocks of the planets. Um, particularly for me, I love the carbonaceous chondrites, which are, are really our only pieces of the outer solar system that we have, um, that we can actually look at. And, but, but a while ago, over the last year, it was the century, the 100th anniversary of, um, or no, it was 90th, sorry, anniversary of uh, the discovery of Pluto. And what, and so we were asked to talk about Pluto a bit, so I developed this talk that I'd like to share with you all now, um, which is just the geology of Pluto, so that's what we're going to go over today. Um, so it's really fun, and Pluto's, as, as we'll see, is a really exciting, really bizarre world. Um, you, sometimes you want to draw with other planets like Mars, you can make analogies to things, you can talk about, oh, you know, this is, you know, we've got the atmosphere, we've got a rocky crust, maybe there was an ocean, there's ice caps. But with Pluto, things are so different, the chemistry is so different, that it's really hard to draw those analogies. So we'll look at especially one called Sputnik Planum, and we'll go over all of that. So start off with, let's go here. So here's a little overview of what we're going over. Um, to start with, I'm going to be talking about our intrepid little robot explorer, New Horizons, the spacecraft that actually went to Pluto. Before, before, the, before New Horizons got there in 2015, um, Pluto was a blurry haze in the Hubble telescope. Um, we could barely see anything, but now we've got all these beautiful high-resolution images thanks to New Horizons. Um, then we'll go over a little bit of the basics of Pluto, so Pluto 101, just things about how big it's Pluto, how far away. Um, and then we'll look at a bit of the geography and look at some of the specific features, which you can see right here. Um, in, in that map just there. And then we'll do, talk briefly about the moons, and then very quickly we'll look at the, the follow-up to the Pluto mission itself, which was New Horizons, because it's going extremely fast, it's, on a, it's at escape velocity, one of the few spacecraft to do that. It's on its way out of the solar system right now after its flyby of Pluto. Um, and on the way out, uh, it stopped by a, a little tiny, tiny world called Arakot. Um, that's the most primitive object we've ever seen, basically a clump of nebula. Um, as a world. So we're going to look at that at the very end too. And then we'll talk about yeah, the fact that it's in this interstellar space and time for questions at the end. So New Horizons, yeah, so New Horizons was launched in 2006. And you can see it's going right out here um, up and intercepted the Pluto system in 2015. Now we say the Pluto system here because Pluto, even though it's not technically a planet, we call it a dwarf planet, um, is, is, is actually a binary planetary system because the center of mass of, of, its, of it and its moon, Charon, or Sharon, um, if you were to balance them on a stick, is actually not inside either of them. So we call it a double binary planetary system or double planet system, even though they're both dwarf planets. And then, yeah, so New Horizons is often, the, these KBOs are what we call the Kuiper Belt objects, so really icy things. So we talk about the asteroid belt in the inner solar system between Mars and Jupiter, but you go further on that, there is a lot more stuff out there that we are only just beginning to discover and understand. So New Horizons was basically a spacecraft, it, it's basically a camera and a spectrometer. Those are its main instruments. They're taking pretty pictures and looking at what the things in those pictures are made of. So a spectrometer, for those who don't know about them, a spectrometer is an instrument that we use to it splits up the light coming into it and using that we can see so it splits it up into different colors and then looking at the intensity of different colors we can use that to figure out what things are made of especially by comparing things to things in the lab um, so that's how we figure out so when i talk about chemical information and chemical composition stuff in this what we're talking about is information that came through the spectrometer um, yeah, oh, and one thing you might notice about New Horizons here is a lot of our solar system exploration craft that you might have seen, um, a lot of them have solar panels, but this one doesn't because it's going so far away, it cannot rely on that. So it's actually relying on a nuclear generator, a small one. So it's basically just a bunch of radioisotopes in there emitting heat, and it's getting power from that. One of the first uh, strange things about Pluto is it's really eccentric, and by that we mean really oval orbit. Um, so most of the planets have very circular orbits. Um, it's got a much more uh, oval-shaped one. And it's also inclined, so most of the planets are in a single plane in the solar system. Um, but Pluto is on this really, really high orbit, kind of. Um, and that's the case with a lot of things out there. They're smaller and they are much further away, so they're less, they're less tightly bound, um, in some ways, uh, to the Sun. So as we said, yeah, it's 30 to 50 times farther away uh, than the Earth is from the Sun. Um, and at that point, it's still the bright, the sun is still the brightest object in the sky, 
but it's only a point of light. So you couldn't actually resolve it right on Earth, right? We can, the sun is about the size of the moon in terms of angular size. You can look at them, they're, you can think of this. Out there, it's a point of light, and it is 250 times brighter than the full moon. So I don't know exactly what that, likes to look, what that is to look like, but it might hurt your eyes to look at it. Um, and out there, of course, it is extremely cold, uh, minus 229 degrees Celsius being typical. Um, but there are a lot of variations in it. Uh, because of this. So Pluto is extremely tilted. So not only is it itself inclined, eccentric, Pluto itself is at a really strange angle to its, um, to its orbit. So we're at about a 25 degree, 24 degree angle roughly to our orbit, and the Earth spins something like, I can't really do that with my hands very well, something like that on its orbit to give us the seasons. Pluto is like this, and it's doing something like this. It's doing these huge oscillations. Um, and what that means is that its summers and winters last an extremely long time. Um, yeah, so on Earth, you know, if you're at the South Pole or any, either of the poles, the daytimes in the summer are six months long, and the winters, uh, the nights in the winter are also six months long. On Pluto, that's true, but they last almost a century. Um, so extremely long periods of day and night. And because of that really eccentric orbit, um, if a summer happens when Pluto is close to the sun, um, so the, the pole pointing towards that, if that lines up, that's what we call these extreme seasons on Pluto. Pluto has extreme seasons that happen as well as the seasons themselves um, when that eccentricity lines up. So then you've got, and th those happen every 800,000 years. So you've got a large cycle there um, that changes the temperature of the poles dramatically. So Pluto is very small. So, yeah, there we go. Here are all the facts here. 0.2% the mass of the Earth, and its surface gravity is less than 10%. So you could kind of walk around, you know, it's not too dissimilar from the moon or so. Um, but wouldn't be easy. And it's about the size of Russia or a little bit over two times the size of Australia. If you've walked across Australia, you could probably walk across this, but pretty cool. And just, just as a comparison in the composition, so whereas we've got a rocky, I mean, an inner metallic core inside the Earth, so these, these two bits are, are metallic, uh, the core of Pluto is, is rocky. And instead of a rocky mantle like we have, so we've got this is where um, a really dense, hot, kind of plastically deforming, so really, really kind of gooey rock is the mantle. Um, instead of that, it's got water ice acting as its mantle. Um, and above that, it's got nitrogen. And this is, again, I want to use the analogy that nitrogen is like the water on the Earth, but it's not exactly, because it's still a solid um, most of the time. So it's not exactly like water on the Earth. Um, but it does form this outer layer. Nitrogen is what dominates that bit. And it's also got an atmosphere. So that's something that we kind of knew about from Hubble. But it's not until we got out with New Horizons that we could actually see how complex and thick that atmosphere is. Um, so you can see it here. We've got these haze layers. So these, these are layers of actual haze in the atmosphere. And that haze is made of organic compounds. So it's a little bit of methane on Mars. And that's part of the atmosphere. And as solar radiation hits that methane, um, it reacts with itself. So that methane reacts and you form more complex organic chemicals. And as that continues, those organic compounds from the methane start to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until they slowly rain out of the atmosphere. So there's a really steady accumulation of rain or haze um, on the surface of Pluto. You can see it again here. Um, it's actually blue. And that's the nitrogen. It's actually blue for the same reason that the Earth's atmosphere is blue, which is the nitrogen in the atmosphere. As I was saying before, so this is, this is one of the first things that, that shocked us. So this is um, this is one of the nice, beautiful pictures of of, of Pluto. Um, is it's an extremely diverse surface. That was one of the first things that struck the the, the scientists working on the mission is that it's not just some dead body. Um, one of the first things we can see is that you've got these really, really cratered ancient terrains like this down here, and then you've also got these really fresh-looking terrains like this. This is Sputnik um, Planum just here. And then you've got kind of intermediate looking terrains, things that are a bit older, um, but not quite ancient. So there's actually resurfacing going on on Pluto. Pluto is an active world. Um, Mars, for example, we can compare it to Mars, and Mars is pretty much an extinct world. It's, it's a dead world. Nothing, the surface itself isn't turning over anymore. Pluto, this is clearly still happening. Um, and just a reminder, there's going to be question time at the end, so don't forget to ask any questions. If I've just glazed over something and you're like, hang on, what was that? Don't just throw that away. What do you mean? Please ask me. Um, so, yeah, so with these organics here, so we were talking about that haze, right, in the atmosphere, and that slowly accumulates, 
And what that means is that we've got kind of an indicator for the surface age on Pluto. So you can see these redder terrains. The more red a terrain is, the more ancient it is generally. Um, so we've got these really ancient red terrains, fresh white surface on Sputnik Planum, and something kind of intermediate over here. This is over, I think, Tartarus Dorsa. Um, so this intermediate age, a little bit red, a little bit cratered, but not quite as red and cratered as this over here. So this is, a, this is our overview of the geography. This is our geography of Pluto session. Um, and so we have Sputnik Planum in that middle here. This is this footprint kind of shaped one. And Cthulhu Regio here. And this is one of the most ancient terrains. So we found out on when we, when, so this is what this, this is what we call the encounter hemisphere. This is the bit that uh, New Horizons got close to as it flew by. Um, as it flew around the other way, we did get to see the far side, the other side, but we didn't get to see as well. But we did see that this Cthulhu Regio type of equi um, band extends all the way around the equator. So you can imagine this thing extending all the way around. Um, and the North Polar region. So we're going to start looking at, uh, oh, first we're going to go over the compositions. Um, so nitrogen, like I said, dominates the surface of Pluto. It's the most abundant chemical there. Um, now, most of it is ice, most of it's solid, and most of that ice is in that Sputnik planet. So that's why you kind of want to use the analogy sometimes that uh, nitrogen is like the water um, on Earth. And um, so nitrogen is kind of like the water and it flows into this plane. Um, and it, so, so it, does, it does flow into it. And it's, it's also the dominant gas in the atmosphere. So again, you want to use the analogy to water, but this plane, as we're going to see, isn't quite analogous to an ocean. It's, it's very solid. It's very different to an ocean. Uh, methane is also a feature here. So we've got, that's also mostly as ice and also as a gas in the atmosphere and maybe even sometimes as clouds. So we've seen some tenuous kind of look, things that look like clouds um, there and also in, in Hubble images as well, things that kind of look like clouds um, that might be the methane. Also carbon monoxide, but that's mostly um, sunk into that Sputnik planum there. And water, as we know, water is, is the, what the bulk of Pluto is, or bulk of the, the mantle of it, um, but that's only exposed um, at the equator, this high, uh, high altitude equatorial region. So that's where we get the water actually being exposed because the nitrogen isn't actually stable there. So you can see it actually not, um, you see there's no nitrogen there. Uh, just a little overview of some of the geography and the names that we've got on Pluto. Um, so what's kind of fun about it is that it's got three main things that it's drawing on. Uh, it's got things that are so uh, often underworld deities. So Pluto itself, of course, is the, the, one of the Greek and Roma, Roman uh, deities of the underworld. Um, but then we've drawn on a number of others as well as fictional ones. So we've got Cthulhu Regio here, the Balrog Macula, um, as well as some others I'm mean, admittedly not as familiar with, the Krun Ala. Um, and then other things that are named after are explorers, and that's a mixture of human and robotic explorers. So we've got um, Viking, which was a Martian rover, uh, Hayabusa, which was a uh, Japanese spacecraft that went to the first asteroid, and then we've also got the Al Adrisi Montes here. So Al Adrisi was an Arab explorer that went into Europe um, and, and back all that. So now we're, yeah, so now we're going to zoom in on Sputnik Planum here and see it in a little bit more detail. So again, you want to kind of call it an ocean, but it's not. It's solid, but it's still doing convection. It's a very strange thing. Um, so yeah, it's got these, these cells. So we call this cellular terrain. And so the middle bit is where the, mater the hot material, now convection, if you're not familiar with the term, is what happens in your kettle when you're boiling your water or when you're cooking a stew maybe. Um, and you've got hot stuff rising up in the middle and then pushing out to the side and then sinking down at the edges. Um, and that's exactly what we've got going on on these cells. Um, so we've got things push up and rise up in the middle and then sink down at these edges. So those are our convection cells. And we can see that these things are quite young uh, because there's, there's no craters on them. We don't see almost any craters on Sputnik Planet. So we expect that these things um, are surfacing pretty fast in a geological time scale, which means maybe they're 100,000, they take 100,000 years, maybe a million years to turn over. We've also got on the edges of Sputnik Planet, we've got these mountain-sized icebergs made me, of water ice. So there's glaciers actually on the edges. So the nitrogen flows into Sputnik Planet. So glaciers form at maybe at higher altitudes, they flow into Sputnik Planet. And as they do that, they break off uh, the, the water ice that forms the basement rock. And these things end up floating out into Sputnik Planet. I mean, you can see it a little bit better on the past one here. So these things like this, 
And these are giant icebergs, but they're the size of mountains on Earth. So these things can be up to five kilometers tall. Um, so gigantic floating mountains. We can also see dunes on top of our convection cell. So that again is evidence um, that the atmosphere can become quite thick on, 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 on Pluto. And so that's something else. Remember that the so that nitrogen is, is is acting as the atmosphere. It's acting as one of the things that's moving around on the surface. Um, so it condenses out of the atmosphere like water does on Earth. It can condense out as an ice or it can be a gas. Um, and on Pluto, during those really intense summers, so much of the nitrogen, uh, it's possible that it, that, it, that it becomes a gas, that the pressure at the surface becomes way greater. So you might actually have liquid nitrogen flowing on the surface of Pluto and wind able to actually blow grains of ice across these dunes, um, across these convection cells, forming these dunes. So, so, so during those intense summers, you have the pressure of the atmosphere um, increase enormously. And the opposite is true during the winter. Um, uh, the atmosphere, most of the atmosphere condenses out and you're in basically a vacuum again. Um, and it just kind of forms a snow. Then during the springtime, when things are heating up, you've got these sublimation pits. Um, so these things are hundreds of meters across. And a sublimation is not a process that happens much on the Earth, but it's where a solid goes straight uh, to a gas without going through a liquid state. Now, most of the time we're used to seeing ice melt in spring. Um, but in the rest of the solar system, especially where pressures are lower on Neptune, I'm sorry, Neptune, well, on Neptune, Neptune's even Triton has it, um, Pluto and Mars as well, things go from solid to gas pretty regularly. So this is what these pits are. They were just, you have a whole piece of the ground just, just evaporating. And next we're going to look briefly at Carteris dorsa here, which is this, what we call the bladed terrain. So you can't quite see the bladed texture here, um, but we're going to zoom in on that now. And so these things are ridges, um, and they can be kilometers tall. Um, and they're basically oriented north-south. So it's called bladed terrain. The description that's from some of the scientists that worked on this is that if you've got all of the knives in your drawer and just kind of stacked them up this way and just did it like that. So this is these alleys in between the knives, alleys in between the knives, and then these just sharp cliffs of methane. And so this is a really bizarre terrain that doesn't really have an analogy on the Earth. And the best thinking about it is that during those extreme summers and extreme winters, um, the nitrogen evaporates from one of the poles, the nitrogen and the methane, evaporate from the current summer pole and migrate to the colder winter pole. And while it's doing that, they're forced up the high altitude equator. equator. So the equator is at quite a high altitude. Um, and just like snow on Earth, so when, uh, you know, if you've got moist air being forced up a mountain, um, you get rainfall and you also get snow um, kind of coming out of the gas. Same thing happens here as, you, as, as these nitrogen and methane winds blow from the summer pole to the winter pole. Um, the methane crystallizes out and forms these massive ridges. And then the nitrogen winds are kind of blowing through the, the, the channels between those huge ridges. Um, so it's a really bizarre terrain that we don't have a huge amount of analogies for on the Earth. And yeah, so next we're going to look at the Cthulhu Meteo here. So this is our most ancient terrain. So again, just that comparison, we've got almost no craters on Sputnik Planum, and then we've got this very heavily cratered Cthulhu Regio. Um, yeah, so lots of craters there, which tells us it's very old. It's been around to experience a lot of impacts. Um, and because it's at that high altitude, that nitrogen isn't actually stable there. So we, get, we see the water ice, that bedrock, exposed. The water ice is exposed here. Um, and because it's so ancient, that water ice is then coated in what we call tholins. And th those are organics that we were talking about, those, those things that, that rain out of the atmosphere from the methane um, getting complex. And then once they're up on the surface, they become even more complex still by solar radiation. So you get these really thick kind of, on Earth, if you were to melt it, maybe it would look like a tar. But out here, it's, it's a kind of, it would be like a solid substance. Um, yeah, so we've got this, this really red uh, layer of these organic compounds. And, and then these white bits, these, these, this is not water ice snow, obviously, this is methane snow forming on those. So it's a little bit maybe like those Tartarus dorsa where the winds kind of blow over here and, and precipitate out on the, uh, on the mountaintops. Um, and again, just remember, if you have questions, please let me know. I know I'm, I'm rushing through everything here. So let me know. Um, so one of the other things that we see in Virgil Fossa, so in Cthulhu Regio, sorry, is the Virgil Fossa. So that's this crack you can see here. 
And so this is a sign of something like tectonism. So maybe that there is actually a liquid layer in between. So we have that icy shell beneath, um, water ice, nitrogen ice on the outside, but in between those two, there might be a liquid layer inside. Um, and in fact, most of that water layer might be liquid. And so this, this, this crack, for one thing, is evidence of it because it means that it's kind of shifting around. And as that, as that solid nitrogen and water ice layer on the outside shifts around, it might crack a bit. Um, but the, the stronger evidence that we have for that is that uh, around that crack, you see a lot more water than you do um, elsewhere. So it looks like, so we call it cryovolcanism, which is just cold volcanoes, um, because it's cold water being squirted out um, of this crack, uh, where that liquid ocean beneath might have just been, might have just pushed that water out. Um, and part of the way that it stays that cold is that all those organic compounds actually form a bit of an antifreeze in there, um, which unfortunately puts a bit of a damper on the idea of astrobiology. Uh, not to say that it's impossible, it's just that any organic chemistry that we know would find it very hard to live in, liquid, in a liquid water ocean with that much antifreeze kind of substances, that, that kind of, um, yeah, with, with that chemistry. So, uh, brief look at the moons now. So we've got Sharon and then these other little moons. We've got Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. Um, now, Sharon itself is a really similar composition to, um, to Pluto. And it looks like it also had a liquid layer inside at one point, but that froze over. And when it froze over, what you can see is this crack here. Um, so what, uh, if you've ever tried putting a water bottle in your fridge, or in your freezer, sorry, and if you screw the lid on too tight and that water can't go anywhere, the pressure can't go anywhere as it expands, your water bottle might crack. That's basically what happened to Karen. Um, the whole planet basically just rifted around the middle um, where the water ice, the liquid ocean inside uh, expanded and cracked the surface. And you also have this weird layer um, of this weird this is the macula, Mordor macula, um, on, on, on Karen, which seems to be some of the tholins coming. So there might be, what it might be is that between these two planets that are orbiting each other, Karen might be stealing some of that methane atmosphere. Um, so there might be some of, some of uh, Pluto's tenuous atmosphere kind of trailing over to Karen. Um, and depositing on there, and then as they deposit, they form those dull ones again. So, so once that methane's on there. And then this is our final view. So this was our final view of Pluto as New Horizons flew past around. So we've got the encounter hemisphere, just everything that we've seen so far. Um, oh, sorry, I should have said, um, I forgot to mention these guys. So these are just tiny little worlds. So these didn't really get to differentiate. They're just little clumps of ice. Um, and so they, they might have, they, it's still argued about whether they accreted along with these other two. So you have a disk of ice as Pluto and Karen are, form, are forming around each other. These little moons might have formed from that disk, or they might be captures um, from other Kuiper Belt objects. They might have just pulled them in and attracted them to it. Yeah, so this here is, is the other hemisphere of Pluto that we didn't get to look closely at. But what you can see is that dark equatorial band again, um, that Cthulhu region. So that is where that very ancient high altitude terrain goes fully around the planet. And New Horizons, as we showed before, kept going. Um, it would be extremely hard to stop. once. You, so, so once New Horizons was going at those speeds to get out here, to get to Pluto at a, in a reasonable time frame, uh, it's very hard to stop. It would have had to carry a lot more fuel to slow itself down. Um, so it just did a flyby. It flew past and then it went to this guy. So they didn't actually know exactly where they were going to go afterwards, but they knew these things were out there and figured that they, being NASA um, and the, the New Horizons team, um, figured that they could deflect it to one that they selected later. And they, they ended up with Arakal. Now it was originally called Ultima Thule, um, which was the most distant place known in Greek uh, mythology, uh, but unfortunately that name is also used by neo-Nazis as the Aryan homeland and the, Na the NASA scientists decided that was not a good uh, name to keep and they chose Arica, which is a Powhatan word from North America. So that was where the original settlers in Virginia um, landed. Um, so that's one of their thunder deities. So it was discovered in 2014, Arica. So yeah, so one, for one thing, it was discovered after New Horizons actually launched. Um, and it is the most primitive object we've ever seen up close. So this is if you were to imagine what happened, what would come out of a nebula, when you see this beautiful, I should have put a picture of a nebula in here, but you see the beautiful picture of clouds in interstellar space. If you were to take a bunch of the ice and dust and just kind of push it together like a snowball, 
this is effectively what that would look like. This is a nebular solid, basically. Um, it's never been heated. It is in the same orbit that it was in four and a half billion years ago when the solar system formed. It's barely moved. So if we look at the asteroids in the inner solar system as a counterexample, they have moved around. Jupiter and Saturn uh, moved in their orbits over time, and that kind of flung around all the smaller bodies. And, and so none of them are really where they originally formed. Everything's been mixed up. But out here, things stayed really still and quiet and stable. So this is exactly where it was. So you can see it's, it's another kind of a double planet. Um, but what happened here is these two tiny bodies, I should say I've got, yeah, it's about 39 kilometers long, slowly, slowly orbited each other, slowly, 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 until they just, they just kind of bumped into each other and stuck. Um, and yeah, so they're mostly made of water ice and organic. So similar composition to Pluto, just they didn't differentiate at all. They're just all mixed up. If you were to go there, you could grab a fistful of this and you would have basically pristine interstar dust. This is the stuff between stars. When you, when you look at the dark band of the galaxy, um, when you look up the Milky Way, that dark band is the dust between stars, and you would basically be getting a sample of that in this kind of object. And as I said before, yeah, uh, New Horizons is on the way out. I haven't added it to this one, but these are the other four probes that have done it, Voyager 1 and 2 and Pioneer 10 and 11. Um, so New Horizons is the fifth spacecraft to achieve escape velocity from the solar system. So it is our, one of our, is our fifth interstellar probe, so it's on the way out. Um, which is very exciting. So I don't know how long it'll last up there, though, actually. Any questions about it? Uh, yes, I've got one question already. Uh, but yeah, if you have questions, yeah, just please keep sending them in. Um, I've got someone who's, who's forwarding them on to me. Now, the first question was, um, are there some places on Pluto that get more craters than other places? And as far as we have any reason to believe, no. Um, it's not that it's a, and it's the same on most bodies. We kind of expect that the Pluto, uh, the, sorry, not Pluto, the the impactors come at all directions, come from all directions. And on Earth, that's far as we can tell. That's exactly what happens here too. Um, things impact the surface from all directions and all angles all the time. So it's fairly random scatter. Um, what the different ages, what the different uh, amount of cratering tells you is much more so about the um, the freshness of the surface. So a, a, a surface that hasn't been changed at all um, gets, uh, gets a lot more craters on it. So if you're, as, an, as another example, Australia is a bit more of a cratered continent than some other fresher, younger places. So if you were to take the, I don't know, the average size of Indonesia, which is a kind of freshly put up mountain chain, it'll have a lot less craters than Australia, which is you know, three billion years old, some parts of it. Um, it's a very ancient terrain, so it's got more craters on it. Um, and likewise here, we've just got very ancient terrain, very fresh and young terrain. Second question, does accretion require heat? How do those two lumps of ice get stuck together if it's never melted enough to create some kind of adhesion? Um, so the adhesion on bodies like this is just gravity. They're just, they're just stuck together, two particles. Um, so the, 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 it's very weak, you know, they're not very big bodies, the gravity isn't, isn't very strong. Um, and you can see that, well, there's actually a little bit of a crater there. Um, but impacts, a, a significant impact would break them apart, possibly very easily and quickly. Um, but it's just a very slow gravitational kind of settling onto each other. Um, but then that gravity wasn't enough to deform their original shape into a ball, which is what happens when you form a larger body. Um, so when you get a larger planet, uh, you don't, the heat doesn't come, so the heat in, in accretion on, on larger bodies is often because these things are coming and flying in hot and bringing a lot of energy with them, whereas this was a very cold collision um, to start with. Yeah, so accretion, accretion doesn't require heat um, is the answer to that, but it definitely can involve a lot of heat, as it did with the Earth. The Earth had massive violent impacts. And especially because we were in the inner solar system where things were being mixed up. Um, so remember, we, yeah, so we've got all those Jupiter and Saturn moving around, which moved all the, all the planetary building blocks around and threw a bunch of these asteroids at the Earth and created these violent impacts, which melted the surface, melted anything that was here. Um, whereas out here was a very slow, steady, stately, graceful affair. Um, things just gently coalesced. Um, what is the, and then so another question, what is the size of Pluto compared to the Earth? Um, now I've got that. 
back here. It's all. <laughs> there you go. So about 2.2 percent the mass. Um, and so you can see the surface area uh, is, it would also be quite small. So it's very small. It's actually it's smaller than the moon. Um, yeah, smaller than the Earth's moon, significantly smaller than the Earth. Um, and yeah, the area of it is about twice the size of Australia. That's all the questions that I've got coming in so far. Um, there, oh, here's another one. How can such a small body hold on to an atmosphere? So that's a good question. Um, sorry, the others are good questions too. I just mean that that's a very, that's a very, um, very perceptive one because when you go to places like Mars, you know, you, we've, it's lost a lot of an atmosphere. Um, so how can this tiny body have anything um, on it? And part of the answer to that is because it's so dang cold. Um, that nitrogen, sorry, let me go back here. That's what I want to, yeah. Um, because it's so cold, the nitrogen, even though it is a gas, is just not kind of vibrating enough to bounce out of the atmosphere um, out there, even though it's barely being held on. It's just simply because it's so cold. And actually that haze, Pluto, one thing that was kind of confusing from Hubble um, and the measurements that were made from Earth, was that Pluto's actually colder than you would expect. Um, so if you were to, you know, just imagine uh, how cold an airless body is at different distances from the sun, you can kind of estimate their temperatures based on just how much light is coming onto them. But Pluto is colder than you would expect for a body without an atmosphere. And part of the reason is because of that methane haze. So because its atmosphere, its, its atmosphere actually affects to cool it down because the methane in that haze reflects more light. Um, so another question is, how far away is Voyager 1 from Earth now? Answer that one, I don't actually know. Um, I don't have the answer to that. I can look that up and I can Google that in just a second, but I don't actually know the answer to that one. Um, how many moons does Pluto have? And how was it, is it five? It's five. Yeah, nailed it. Um, so we got, uh, yeah, Karen's its major one. Although I could say maybe we, could, we should actually kind of say, Four moons around a double planetary system. Um, so if you put on Karen, Karen's not really technically a moon because it's the center of mass of these bodies is outside of Pluto, which makes it a double planet system, not a planet moon system like the Earth. Um, so four little moons, possibly more smaller ones. Um, New Horizons did look for more, but it didn't see any. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any. It flew by very fast, so it didn't get to spend a long time out there looking for more. Yeah. Any other questions? That, that's all we've got right now. Um, any other questions about Pluto? I hope I didn't speak too fast. I hope you could all hear me. This is my first time doing this over Zoom, public talk like this. I really get to see the audience's face and see how they're responding. Okay, so I've got another question. How do you know the center of mass is in the middle of Pluto and Karen? Um, by, as by knowing their mass, their, their individual masses, um, or sorry, partly by knowing their densities, um, but we can, we can estimate them based on their composition and how fast they're spinning around each other. Um, so we know that they're made of a lot of ice, a lot of rock. Um, and by knowing how fast they're spinning around each other, we can estimate um, their respective masses. Um, from the amount of angular momentum they've got. And yeah, once, once you know those respective masses, then it's just a matter of um, kind of balancing those, just taking the distance between those. And it's almost like, you know, in the model, you're kind of really just, if you're trying to, if you're trying to imagine it, you just have a stick between the two and you're trying to kind of put your finger on and balance in the middle of it. Um, and on the Earth, in the Earth-Moon system, that balancing point is inside the Earth, um, if you do that calculation, whereas with, with Pluto and Karen, it's on the outside of Pluto. Who discovered Pluto? Oh, gosh, I should know this one, because <laughs> we talked about it. Um, was it Clyde Tombaugh? Because that was, sorry, this feels like, a, who wants to be a millionaire? You know, now I'm on the hot seat. Um, Sorry, guys, I am Googling this. You just saw that. But I think it's Clyde Tumble. Yes. Okay, so it's Clyde Tumble. 
Um, and an extra fun fact was that it was named by a schoolgirl who just kind of wrote into them, um, from what I understand. And just had been reading about mythology in a book and was like, Pluto would be a good name for that, in terms of the, the thought of the underworld in this dark, cold place. Um, so as a child, that actually named it. That was in the 19th. Yeah, 19th. Any more questions? Okay, so we've got no more questions coming in. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you all for coming. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope it made sense. Uh, yeah, thanks. Stay safe, everyone.